we are situated very near the place where, in the spring of 1522, an inspired man sowed a seed, which was going to blossom into an enormous fruitful tree that was to reach out throughout the Universal Church. At the outset, its roots did not penetrate the soft foundations of Renaissance culture, but penetrated the hard rock of a cave, a cave chosen by this pilgrim to carry out his penances and his profound contemplative prayers. Dressed in sackcloth and practically barefooted, this unknown person came from the monastery and sanctuary of Montserrat to Manresa, where it was his desire to pray all night in true knightly fashion to carry out the vigil of his newly acquired spiritual arms, having at last discarded both his gentleman's attire and his captain's sword. The first steps of this spirituality took place in Montserrat, where he was so influenced by what he had experienced there that he postponed his plans to travel to the Holy Land and settled in Manresa. This new man divided his time between working at the hospital of Santa Lucia and attending Vespers at the cathedral and praying matins at the Dominican monastery. People sought him out, both in order to see his acts and to ask for spiritual guidance. The children nicknamed him the man in sackcloth, whilst the very poorest benefited from his attentions. Feeling the need to withdraw from the world, he resorts to the hermitages on the outskirts of the city until he finally settles in a cave overlooking the Cardonaire River. His penances are so severe that he falls ill and is looked after by some pious ladies. And whilst this man lies prostrate in a deep lethargy, which may be presumed to be a state of rapture, one may well wonder who this strange person is, who seems mad for the love of God, as the monks, who he was with in Montserrat, described him and also what his true identity may be. Where did he come from? And how did he arrive at the cave? Inigo Lopez de Loyola and Sainz de Licona, such is his name, was from the Basque country. He's 30 years old and walks with a limp. He was wounded in the war and his legs were particularly affected. This severe wound was received during the war defending the Pamplona garrison for the emperor when fighting against the French. Inigo de Loyola fought heroically as he was in the service of his relation, the Duke of Nájera, whom he had helped in other political missions. As has been said by Pedro de Riba de Naira, his first biographer, young as he was in the prime of his life, he was very well known as being clever and prudent in affairs of the world and intelligent at solving problems and differences of opinion. Where did Inigo get this political wisdom and diplomatic experience? As just an adolescent, he had been trained in court life by Juan Velázquez de Cuella, head purser to the king. Leaving his parents and his many brothers and sisters, he lived for 10 years in a village called Arevalo, alternating military training with courtly refinements. Thus, this young man, both vigorous and refined, as his first biographer describes him, dreams of imitating the chivalric models of Amadis de Gaula and Tiran Lo Blanc, highly desirous of gaining honor, but to no avail, as he himself recalls years later. Page boy and courtier up to the age of 25, both a military man and a diplomat at an early age, everything seemed to predict a glorious future, both in military affairs and worldly ones. But the wound received in Pamplona and endless months of convalescence were to totally change his future. Bored with books of chivalry, he becomes an avid reader of the lives of the saints. Above all, he had a great desire to travel to the Holy Land so as to become better acquainted with the life of Jesus, his new master, and so he set out. Manresa did not come into his plans, but what was to have been just a stopping place became a founding place his primitive church, as he would call it many years later. Now we know who we are dealing with and whence this strange visitor came from. We would look for him without success in the streets of Manresa 
and finally find him taking refuge once again in the cave, engrossed in profound prayer and contemplation, and undergoing his dark nights of the soul. Ignatius, having overcome his severe penances and serious health disorders, has a visit from God himself and is illumined as to the mysteries of the Christian faith. The presence of Jesus is so intense during this time that he himself explains years later that it was as if I saw Jesus with his own eyes and felt with his hands. During this period, he begins to understand that one must feel and taste interiorly the presence of Jesus in order to give oneself up entirely and without reserve to him. His most important experience is the illumination he receives by the river Cardona, which offered him the means to understand many aspects of spiritual life, of faith and his readings, to such an extent that he saw all things as fresh and new. So profound was his experience that afterwards he seemed to be an entirely new man, a new person with a different intellect and understanding to that he had had previously. Ignatius will always remember Manresa as his primitive church, the place where his new birth into God comes about. The spiritual exercises, which were to become famous throughout the church, have their origin in these personal mystical experiences. During the following 20 years, he will continue to draw up a new method of prayer and discernment to discover how God calls each individual. The question that this knightly penitent often posed was, what should I do from now on in order to serve my new and only Lord? How should I plan my life so as to discover God's will more easily? How do I get to know Jesus better and in such a manner as to consecrate not only my memory, my intelligence and my will to him, but all my freedom, only desiring God's love and God's grace. From then on, God guided the pilgrim from Ranresa along unexpected paths. His plan to settle in the Holy Land was not to be. So, back in Europe, the pilgrim now understands that God is asking him to fulfill a new ministry in the church a more committed role. To accomplish this end, he starts to study in Barcelona, Alcalá, Salamanca, Paris and Venice, where he was ordained as a priest. Finally, he arrives in Rome and decides to settle there for good. There, other companions join him, moved by the same desire to serve Jesus and work for the salvation of souls throughout the world. And these enthusiastic friends end up by forming an apostolic society, directly serving the Pope and under the banner of the cross. The main lines of action of this society are, as the recent general congregations have been expressing, the irradiation of faith and the promotion of justice, along with attention to cultural diversity, respect and dialogue with other religious traditions. The present society considers these four fields inseparable and aims specially to attend those distant and the disinherited. More than ever before, in this global world, the Jesuits feel themselves obliged to build a bridge of contact between northern countries and countries in the south, and between those believers who identify themselves with the Christian tradition and those who seek in other traditions, revealing and nourishing the seeds of the Word of God, seeds that are planted far beyond our frontiers in the most diverse areas, in the field of culture, in the arts, in science, whilst also bearing in mind the problems of education and of young people. All this apostolic irradiation, so generous and universal, will, as it spreads throughout the world, be constantly influenced by the spirit of the exercises and the constitutions which Ignatius conceived in Manresa. Thus a global town has been born, for the name of Manresa appears in many spiritual centers, in teaching institutions, 
and in many publications all over the world. The fruitful root, which this pilgrim originally sowed in the cave, has been transformed into a mighty, fertile and luxuriant tree for the greater glory of God and to serve mankind.